April is National Childhood Abuse Prevention Month. And when we asked Laura to speak with us a few months ago, I had no idea that this was today. <laughs> so that's just perfect. Um, so Laura Porter, directed she, she directed the Washington State Family Policy Council and Council Office of ACE Partnerships and that office also. Uh, she worked with the legislature and state agencies and the tribes to improve public health. She was also a um, Mason County Commissioner from 1990 through 1994. And uh, some of her accomplishments, but not all, were to improve water quality guidelines and um, for Mason County also um, she helped establish the Mason County Transit Authority. And today she's going to talk to us about her ongoing project, ACE, which stands for Adverse Childhood Experience. Okay, so I'm going to move over so I can advance the slide. Sorry, I'm not sorry, the camera person. And if anybody needs to move around so you can see better, um, feel free to do that in the corner, it might be hard to see. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about this bundle of science that we've nicknamed NEAR. Uh, and it's a bundle of science that tells us how experience shapes human development um, across the life course and across generations. So that NEAR stands for neuroscience, epigenetics, adverse childhood experience, and resilience. And when we look at that body of science together, we get a pretty clear and clearer and clearer year by year um, understanding of how experience is shaping human development. And I'm talking about this because much of the science I'm going to present is uh, new. It's within the last couple of decades. And because this is particularly relevant in Mason County. So I'll be talking to you about why that's true. Uh, so first of all, I want to say that across the country, there's been a big wave, a lot of interest in this notion of resilience. The idea that people that go through a lot of adversity um, can bounce forward into very positive lives. And while that's um, undoubtedly true, most of us in this room probably have had that experience, I've uh, gotten to the place where I feel like uh, setting our sights on resilience is setting our sights too low. Because resilience means doing well in the face of great adversity. And I don't know about you, I would like less adversity, especially for these <laughs> next generations coming up. And so I'm thinking more about this word flourish. Uh, and flourish means to prosper with sustained and continuous and steady uh, and strong, growing into well-being. And I, I like that notion that we're all on a journey. Regardless of our starting point, we can all be on a journey um, of well-being. And we can notice when others have fallen off that pathway and help them come back onto it, um, and we can notice that for ourselves as well. So I want to start with a little bit of neuroscience. I'm just going to give you a snippet of neuroscience here. Um, our partner, Dr. Martin Teicher, who's one of the world's leaders in studying how uh, particularly maltreatment shapes brain development during uh, childhood, uh, has advised us on all the science you'll see here. And what he has learned through his research is that all human beings um, have brains that will adapt to the experience we have as we're growing and developing from conception uh, through our developmental years. And all of us have brains that are preparing for the world our bodies are, are thinking we're going to live in. Um, and so we prepare moment by moment throughout our childhoods. And in an ideal world, we would only have short duration stress, maybe 20 minutes at a time. And there would, by stress, I mean, um, those kinds of major stressors that create the fight, flight, freeze response, the high levels of stress chemicals in our bloodstream, uh, including cortisol and adrenaline, those chemicals that help us respond to danger well. So in an ideal world, we would have short duration uh, of those major stressors, and there would be an adult nearby that could get us to safety, and then that adult would do some pretty ancient techniques to help us calm back down. They might rock us, put the head against the heart, they might swing, they might sing, hum, help us with rhythm. 
And over and over and over, that happens throughout childhood. So we end up with thousands of repetitions of high alert status followed by soothing. And over time, we're uh, essentially mimicking and then learning um, those ways of soothing until it becomes just a fluent way that we know how, when we're on high alert, to bring ourselves back down to a soothed state. But not everybody lives in a place where there's somebody who's ready um, at moment's notice to help us with safety. Um, and it's not always possible to help us with safety. Sometimes we're living in an environment that's dangerous and we have to weather longer term dangers. And when people grow up with a lot of dangerous um, circumstance, either episodic danger, where they never know where the next danger is coming from, and so they stay on that high alert status with high levels of cortisol and adrenaline in their bloodstream for a long period of time. Or that same chemical stress response happens when there's long duration danger, when you have, are in danger for a long period of time. And what's happening then is the brain is preparing for you to live in a dangerous world. You're going to develop fairly typical characteristics. You're going to be more hypervigilant. You're going to be quicker to anger or get into a highly emotional state and slower to soothe. You might be less relationally oriented and much more oriented toward mission and survival. You might have a hard time having a very rational conversation at the same time you're in a highly emotional state. These are all characteristics that are actually very important to help the species survive if, in fact, we're going to live in a dangerous world all of our lives. So this is an adaptation to stress during development. And if we grow up in a very safe world, we have the same kinds of circumstance. Our brains are uh, actively developing and adapting in order to live in a very safe world. We'll have developed pretty typical characteristics. We're going to be more relationally oriented. We might love the process of chaotic kind of processes of brainstorming and finding many solutions. We might really be very good at uh, talking things through at the same time we're in a very highly emotional state. And you can imagine how these differences might get in the way of relationship, where one person in the relationship loves to talk things through right in the middle of all the emotion, and the other person's like, no way, I have to go for a walk, I might need to do some drumming, I might need to do some running in order to calm back down so I can have that conversation with you. These are biological responses to the environments that we grow up in. And Dr. Teicher says that these responses, neither one of these tracks are maladaptive. Uh, these are both adaptive, they both help the species survive if in fact we're going to live in the same world all of our lives that we grew up in. Um, but the problem comes when there's a dissonance between how I biologically responded to the stress during development and what society expects of me. If I grew up in a very dangerous world and I'm expected to, in a highly emotional state, talk things through very rationally, I'm expected to sit very calmly through um, in, in a long, uh, maybe through school, sit calmly in class when there's chaos and loud noises and other kinds of distractions around me, I may not biologically be wired to sit calmly in those environments. And so it's not a thought process that people go through, it's a biological stress response when there's highly stressful environments, their bodies are going to respond based on how they've adapted during childhood. So that's a little snippet of neuroscience. I'm going to give you a little snippet of epigenetics. Epigenetics is a pretty new field. Um, just in the last 20 years, we've seen uh, uh, more and more development of this field. And epi means on top of, genetics means origin. And epigenetics is a process by which experience is creating um, uh, chemical tags on our genetic code, which allow our cells to read that section of code or not, or to read the code differently. So this diagram shows that uh, we have an X chromosome here on the left. Our genetic code um, is either in X or Y, right, female or male. Um, and uh, that genetic code is, uh, if we were to stretch it out very long, um, straight, it would be nearly six feet long, mm -hmm. and it has to organize itself to fit into nearly every cell in our body. And so it has to organize uh, in some way where the genetic code can expand and be read in certain sections of the code or contract. 
And so it does that by wrapping around these protein balls that are called histones. And what geneticists found uh, was that there's uh, ta chemical tags, um, the most talked about right now in terms of human behavior or uh, methylation uh, of uh, these um, genetic code sections. And the methylation tags actually give instruction for whether that section of code would expand and be read by the cell or stay contracted and not be read by the cell. I'm oversimplifying because we would have to have a very long lesson and because I'm not a geneticist. <laughs> uh, so, but basically, this process allows our experience to shape how our cells are interpreting um, our genetic code. And our experience is shaping um, our life and at the cellular level um, through this process. And that's partly uh, through our developmental years and then through the rest of our lives. So I like to tell a little story that came from uh, one of the epigeneticist labs uh, that helps us understand a little bit more about the practical realities of this process. And that is a story about scientists that were raising white rats in a lab and they used behavior modification to cause those rats to be afraid of the smell of cherry blossom. And they would waft the smell of cherry blossoms into this enclosure where the rats lived. And uh, the rats became afraid of the smell of cherry blossoms. And so when the smell would come into the enclosure, the rats would uh, run to the corner, uh, mound themselves up. The outer rats would protect the inner rats and wait in fear until the smell of cherry blossoms was taken out of their environment. These scientists then took away the smell of cherry blossom, they moved these rats to another environment that had never had any cherry blossom exposure. Those rats had rat pups. Rat pups grew up uh, and they were adults living in a completely different environment. And one day the scientists wafted that smell of cherry blossoms into their environment. And what do you think those rat pups, now adults, what do you think they did? They were, they were afraid. They ran to the corner, they mounted themselves up, they responded in fear of this smell. And it may seem obvious that the reason that it would be really useful for the younger generation to be afraid of cherry blossoms under those conditions is it's really nice if that whole generation, nobody has to die if cherry blossom smell really is poisonous, for example. So it's survival. We human beings have developed, actually all mammals have developed, this elegant way of passing these critical messages from one generation to the next through epigenetic tags. And some of these tags, not all of them, but some of these tags are heritable, meaning they're passed on from generation to generation. But it's also true that they're fluid, meaning throughout our lives these tags are making changes based on our experience, and those changes, depending on the timing, may show up in our grandchildren's or great-grandchildren's lives. Uh, so as we think about this, it helps us to understand why groups of people in a community might experience more depression or more anxiety or more fear than other groups of people. It could be because of the history of their ancestors that they might experience that. And now epigeneticists are beginning to do research about um, more positive kinds of uh, responses in life. You know, researchers often start with the negative and then they move to something more positive. And the early animal studies of nurturing behaviors are very promising. They're now saying they think that the ease in nurturing uh, other human beings is likely passed through epigenetic codes on to the next generation. So when I'm speaking to groups of young parents, I'll often say, you know, if you knew that you could pass to your grandchildren an ease in nurturing other people, wouldn't it be worth it to fake it for a generation, really, if we had to? Right. Um, in order to pass that, because many young parents find parenting very difficult. Um, and there are a lot of good reasons that they might. Um, and those reasons are complex. We're going to talk about some of them. But we see tremendous motivation among young parents um, to do what it takes to pass on more of an ease in helping other human beings. So I'm going to talk next about the Adverse Childhood Experience Study. It is the largest public health study um, of its kind. It was developed as a partnership between Kaiser Permanente and San Diego, their wellness clinics, and uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. 
And the person uh, at Kaiser Permanente who was the co-principal investigator was Vince Folletti. Uh, Vincent Folletti was in charge of the wellness clinics for Kaiser Permanente. And the person at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention was Dr. Dr. Rob Anda. Uh, Rob Anda was a senior scientist at the time at the CDC. And Rob Anda is my business partner. So when you see the logo ACE interface, that's Rob and myself. Uh, so Rob has obviously um, worked through all of the details and can confirm everything that I'm going to show you about the study. There were over 17,000 participants in this study. Uh, these Kaiser, Kaiser Permanente insured adults were well educated. They had fairly good incomes. Um, they were generally fairly well because they were going to wellness clinic. Um, and, uh, and they gave permission uh, for the scientists to have access to their medical records for the rest of their life. So in addition to looking back at their childhoods and answering questions about their experiences during childhood, uh, they also said, and you can watch my life unfold and look at my health over time. So it's both retrospective and prospective. And this is, uh, I believe, the largest public health discovery of all time. And in order to kind of get some perspective on that, I sometimes tell a story about another public health discovery that most of you know about. Um, and that happened in the early 1800s, early and mid 1800s. So if you lived in London in uh, the early 1800s, you would have experienced waves of disease come across the city, except we didn't know they were disease. We perceived it as waves of death. And in that, those waves, we could wake up in the morning and everyone in the household would be well, and by nightfall, half of the family members would be gone. And those waves would come into the city, and tens of thousands of people would die, and then the wave would disappear, and no one understood why. There were lots of theories about it, lots of ideas about it. Some people thought it was because those people with bad beliefs would die. Some people thought certain family history made you die. Though we might recognize those prejudices as the ways we guess when we don't understand the dynamics that are affecting a population. But there was a prevailing belief at that time, and that was that the deaths were caused by miasma, the smell in the air. And so uh, some of the strategies they were using to solve this problem were they put uh, wooden uh, boards over the open troughs of sewage that ran through the city. Probably a pretty good idea. Uh, but they also hung giant filigree iron um, um, hangings from tall posts so they could burn incense and fill the air with the smell of incense because they were trying to change the smell in the air. So that is something that we call a mental model. When the, lots of the population believes they know the truth now, they don't really have to think outside that box because they know the truth. And mental models are really powerful. For every human being, once we know the truth, it's like we made a little um, cubby, like your kindergarten cubby. And all the information that matches your truth goes into that cubby, and all the information that doesn't match your truth will go right on by. You don't even really know it came into your brain. You just pass it by because it doesn't have a place to fit. So unless we intentionally challenge our mental models, um, we can miss a lot of important facts. So at this time, lots and lots of people believed, well, it's miasma, and so those solutions we have to generate all about the smell in the air. But there was a doctor at that time, Dr. John Snow, who was saying, I, I just can't line up all those facts. Here he is questioning the mental model of the day and saying, it can't be the smell in the air. It has to be something else because people are not dying of lung symptoms. They're dying of intestinal symptoms. And so John Snow was talking to his friends, this can't be, it has to be something else. So imagine you're a friend of Dr. Snow's in 1854, welcome. So the next wave of this death hit the city, and John Snow begins to do something we now call shoe leather epidemiology. He put a mark on a map every time there was a death. And it didn't take very long before there were many, many marks around one water pump, the Broad Street Pump. So imagine you're in your home and Jon Snow comes with his map and he runs up those big stone steps to your London home and he knocks on that heavy oak door and you open it and he says, I've got it! It's the water! What do you do? What do you do? Don't drink the water. Yeah, you stop drinking the water, right? And you might tell people, don't drink the water. Those are the two things in a major public health discovery that save lives early, just after the discovery. 
it would be decades before there was enough knowledge and acceptance of germ theory that people understood what was wrong with that water. It would be decades before they understood that one river was contaminated and the other was not, and so people shouldn't drink out of any of the uh, cisterns that were filled from one river. It would be over a hundred years before we had clean water law in, um, in developed nations of the world. And I will say, um, those of you who worked with me at Mason County probably remember it, even in the early 90s, we were still having debates at the Board of Health about whether water quality really mattered. It takes a long, long time before we change not only the social norms, but also the laws and the legal framework that allow us to be fully protected after a major public health discovery. So I tell you this story because Rob, Anna, and Vince Folletti's discovery about the power of adverse childhood experience to shape health across the life course is at least as large a discovery as Jon Snow's. And it, we're in the beginning. We're only two decades in. We don't have new law. We don't have all of the infrastructure that we will eventually have. And so what we do now is we tell everyone and we act in our own sphere of influence. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what that might look like. So when Rob Anda and Vince Folletti were starting the ACE study, this was um, basically their hypothesis, although we've added the bottom line of this pyramid to it. Um, at the time, almost all prevention research was identifying the risk for disease. Um, we had lists of risk and protective factors, um, and Rob Anda in particular had won international awards for his work uh, with heart disease prevention using that model. And he and Vince Folletti said, you know, we just can't line up those facts. It can't all be the, about the risk factors because risk is not random. Risk is concentrated in certain population groups. So there has to be something driving the risk. And so they uh, hypothesized that perhaps adverse childhood experience was driving social, emotional, and cognitive development in a way that was generating risk. And that, in turn, was leading to disease, disability, and social problems. At the time of the study, we didn't have yet the neuroscience I just talked about. We didn't have the epigenetic research. In fact, we didn't even have the technology that we now use to study in those fields. Uh, and so this was a very different kind of hypothesis for its day. Now we understand more about how um, these characteristics are transmitted across generations. So Rob and I have added this bottom layer just to say that we know now that historical trauma and generational adversity increase the risk for adverse childhood experience, which changes development, et cetera, on up. So if you imagine that this pyramid represents a life course, and you're growing and developing up through the center toward the end of your life, you'll see that this is a life course model uh, for looking at how disease and disability might be unfolding in the population. So these scientists looked at 10 categories of, of adversity. Uh, they bounded for the, uh, the study with these 10 for a couple of reasons. One is they had all of the health history data and current health data for over 17,000 people. They only could take so many more data points <laughs> in order to work with. I've forgotten what Rob said the number of data points was, but it's some gigantic number. So they decided they would uh, look at what happens inside of a household. And the second reason they chose this 10 was that they were very interested in making sure their study would be actionable. And this set of 10 experiences all has some literature behind it on how do we prevent it. So they were interested in learning about things that happen in children's lives that create this stress response but are preventable. So they looked at these three kinds of abuse, physical, sexual, and emotional. They looked at physical neglect and emotional neglect. And they looked at five indicators of household functioning that could create that kind of fight, flight, freeze, stress response for children as they're growing up. They looked at having a mentally ill, depressed, or suicidal person in the home, having a drug addicted or alcoholic family member. They looked at parental discord and they used as a proxy measure divorce or separation. They looked at witnessing violence against mom and incarceration of a family member. And they saw incarceration as twofold. One is the chaos and secrets that happen when there's illegal behavior in a household. And second, you lose a parent or a household member for a period of time. So the first thing that they noticed uh, was that these categories rarely come in singles. They almost always come in clusters. 
And there wasn't any particular pattern of clusters. There could be any array of these um, in a group. But what they saw in the data was that among all of the people of the 17,400 plus that had at least one adverse childhood experience category, 87% had more than one category in their history. And at that time, all the literature was really written uh, uh, separately. So there was a whole separate literature on physical abuse. It's a separate literature than having an incarcerated family member, which is a separate literature than sexual abuse, and on and on. And they said, it doesn't make sense to study it in that way, because that's not how it happens in people's lives. It comes in clusters. And so what they did was create a simple way of looking at the accumulation of many kinds of adversity during childhood, and that's an ACE score. So there are 10 categories. Um, maybe I'll go back to that slide. Um, the ACE score is just a simple count of the number of categories that a person experienced while they were growing up, before their 18th birthday. Um, so you could have zero if you experienced none of these. You could have 10 if you experienced all of these. Um, So another uh, critical thing that they noticed was that these, uh, the ACE score, the accumulation of different kinds of adversity, um, has a strong graded relationship or a dose-response relationship to many different kinds of health and social challenges. Um, and you all know dose-response. The more gas or electricity you put in your car, the more miles you can drive. Or if you're going to go on a hike, the more heavy stones you put on the backpack, the uh, more tired you're going to be on your hike, right? Um, it's dose response, and in this case, as the dose, the number of ACE, the uh, number of ACE categories gets bigger, the health risk in the population also gets larger. So we're going to look at um, some bar graphs that just uh, represent this dose response, uh, and they usually look like a stair-stepped pattern. I'll show you one, and this one has three different challenges listed on it, and that represents um, the life course. So early smoking initiation, current smoking as an adult, and then later uh, lung disease, COPD. And so the, along the bottom are, um, you would imagine, are those A scores. In each cluster of bars, the first one on the left is A score of zero. So that's the group of people who reported they had none of those categories. The next bar is the group of people that reported one. The next is two, three, and the final bar on the right in each of these clusters is the group that said they had four or more. So you can see um, for each of these, uh, the height of the bar is the percentage of the population um, of that population group uh, that was uh, smoking by age 14 on the left. Um, and you can see that as the A score goes up, the percentage of the population that started smoking young went up the percentage of the population that continued to smoke into adulthood went up, and the percentage of the population that developed COPD also went up. And we see the same pattern for uh, many, many uh, challenges. I'll show you a few more, but I'm not going to take a lot of time there. Um, but I want to point out that we've already covered that adversity creates this biological adaptation, probably also creates some social adaptation. Um, and what happens then is society responds. And how do our major social systems respond to people that are hypervigilant, very quick to anger, very slow to soothe, have a difficult time remaining rational when they're in an emotional state? How do we respond? We lock them up. We lock them up. Mm -hmm. yeah. Create Just more trauma. trauma. Um, ignore it. Expel. We ignore it. We, we respond with fear. Fear. Yeah. We, we expel. We diagnose. Um, and so this isn't just about a biological response, that is a part of it, but it's also about the response of the social response to individuals who have adapted to adversity in their lives. And I'll come back to that in a minute because that social response matters, uh, and especially in Mason County for a variety of reasons. So this is, um, I'll walk you through three charts that are also about life course unfolding. This is initi uh, early initiation of drug use. These are laid out all the same way, the ACE score along the bottom. The height of the bars is the percentage in each of these groups that began using uh, drugs before the age of 14. This is ever having a drug problem. And they had both the self-report and the medical records for these people. 
and this is uh, liver disease. So you can see the progression over time that occurs. And if I had more time, I could go walk you through dozens and dozens of this kind of chart. Uh, you can see these same dose response, the stair-stepped pattern with risk, which is the top um, set of bar charts, with all of the leading causes of death, um, including the ones that are in the middle section, and with challenges that we have at work and in the social context, including worker injury, missing work, being unemployed, and homelessness. So ACEs predict in the population not only um, in these individual problems, but they also predict co-occurring challenges. This slide comes from Rob Anda from the original study data. And what he did was he uh, thought about different brain functions and then what indicators he had of those functions from the data set that he had. So he looked at affect regulation, somatic or body issues, substance use, sexuality, memory, and arousal. And he chose um, these indicators um, of those challenges in people's lives. And so this particular uh, bar chart um, has the A score also along the bottom, but the, t the height of the bar is the mean number of co-occurring challenges that people had from that list. And you can see that uh, of the group of people that had zero or one adverse childhood experience category, they, have, they were managing less than two uh, co-occurring challenges in their life. But the people with very high A scores, A scores of seven or eight, were managing four and a half. The mean number was four and a half co-occurring challenges from, from the list. So I, what they realized, oops, sorry, was that the A score doesn't include all the kinds of adversities that may be shaping us biologically as we're growing, genetically as we're growing up, but they do provide a pretty good proxy indicator of the dose of toxic stress that a population has. And I just want to stop for a moment and make sure there's not any confusion that the A score doesn't predict anything at the individual level. It predicts at the group level. So I could tell you I have an A score of five, and I do, my A score is five, and you don't know anything about my health. You don't know whether I was incarcerated, you don't know I was at home, you don't know anything about me because my A score is not predictive at the individual level. If we had 100 people in this room, all of whom had an A score of five, we would know something about the risk for the group. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, and so we have to be a little bit careful because we're not often used to thinking in population terms, and this is a population health study. Um, so for those of you who just spent time calculating your A score, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> it's not predictive at that level, but it does give us uh, a pretty reliable indicator of the amount of stress and the amount of adaptation that might have happened in the population. So let's look at that amount in Mason County. So we've, uh, we've collected ACE information from adults throughout Washington. We collected in 2009, 10, and 11. We were one of the first states, I think we were the only, we were the first state to collect three consecutive years and have enough data to look at the local patterns um, and compare places to other places. And on this uh, map, this particular map is uh, the percentage of population uh, with A scores of three or more. Green is good, uh, this brown color is uh, the highest prevalence, and uh, Mason County, you can see here, is in the highest prevalence group. But maybe more importantly, I will tell you that we're the 51%. We are the highest ACE prevalence in Washington State. Now, uh, just recognize that the age prevalence in a population reliably predicts risk, health challenges, social challenges, productivity challenges. It reliably predicts how difficult life might be in Mason County for the population as a whole. And when we look then at much higher age prevalence, we look at six or more, we see this map here. And again, um, Mason County, around the greater Shelton area, um, has um, the highest prevalence of, at, we're at the 22% of uh, people in the greater Shelton area have an A score of six or more. Did that include the prison population? No, um, it's a telephone survey, so the people would have had to have a landline. Um, calls weren't made to nursing homes, prison, that sort of thing. Um, so Mason County, my people might experience life being difficult because it is more difficult. Uh, because as a population, 
we are holding a different level of developmental stress um, coming into our adulthood. And the ACE prevalence in a population reliably predicts all of these things, and I can send a PDF of this file to whomever and you can have it. Um, but I, so you don't need to memorize this, for, certainly. Um, but risk, um, mental health challenges, social problems, disease rates, and the intergenerational transmission of ACEs to the next generation. Um, so I just want to sum up that section of this talk by saying the memory of our experience, especially our experience while we're developing, during childhood, is stored in our bodies. It's stored because the stress chemicals as we're growing up are literally sculpting of our, our brain development and because the experience that we have during childhood is changing those tags that allow our genetic code to be interpreted by ourselves. And that's happening to help us survive and it can create risk and challenge for the population. So as we move forward, uh, it's really important, especially in Mason County, that we learn about the effects of developmental stress, that we realize the prevalence in Mason County, that we resist uh, the temptation just to reject and eject everyone who has particular challenges as a result of that development, and build better skills and capabilities, which will not be easy um, to work with people who have a lot of developmental uh, stress in their lives and start responding and building opportunities for people uh, to participate in community leadership that really is, I think of it as a right fit. People may not be able to have the usual leadership roles. Their lives may be more difficult than that, but they could have some role in uh, helping the community to heal and helping us be on that pathway to flourishing. So I wanted to uh, give you a little bit of a deeper um, insight into how toxic stress is sculpting the brain as we're developing. And I'm going to move through this pretty fast, but um, in the end I'm going to say that one of the things you could do would be to host a longer educational event for the community. And there are several ways you could do that. Um, because as people really understand more of the detail of how we're shaped by uh, stress during development, that helps us know what strategies we can use to be really helpful to so um, this is a, just a phrase that lots of people like to use, uh, what fires together, wires together, and that's because our brain development is experience dependent. Um, and so experience is actually creating uh, the neural network, the connectedness among the neurons in our brains as we develop. Um, this slide shows at birth that we have uh, individual neurons and uh, brain cells that are largely unwired. Um, they're reaching out, they're ready to connect with each other, but it's experience that begins to actually create those strong channels for communication, not only among the cells, but also across the regions of our brain. By elementary age, we largely um, have many, many pathways, thousands and thousands of pathways, and then at puberty, we go through another period of time that's called pruning, where the pathways that are used the most remain strong, and the pathways that are not used as much go into the shadows. And I like to think of it like if you walk in the woods every day on the same path, that path's going to be real clear. Um, but if you stop walking it five years later, it's still going to be there, but you're not going to be able to find it as easily. And that's what we've learned from stroke recovery. Those pathways that are developed as we're growing um, are still there, but if we haven't used them for a long time, they tend to go into the shadows during puberty, and we can recover them later, but it takes more effort to do that, more repetition. And the way we build new neural uh, pathways in our brain is through repetition. So if those of you who've known someone or if you've gone through a stroke recovery program, you will repeat many, many times and that's why, because you're strengthening a neural pathway so that you can use a new pathway for that same function that you maybe had lost. So because experience is shaping development, we each actually have a different um, experience of the world moment by moment right now in this room uh, because we have essentially a filtering system that involves the brain stem that's in charge of all our automatic functions and the limbic system in charge of our response to stress our fight flight freeze response and much of our memory system uh, and that filtering system actually takes in all of the sensory information from our five senses and filters 
all of it up into our frontal lobe where we can think it through, or based on our past experience, it will filter some of it out and fo help us focus on only that part of the sensory information that our brains are estimating are most important for survival. So we're actually in this moment experiencing the temperature of the room differently from one another, the light in the room differently from one another, and on and on and on. And so as we start to work more with the science, we can get better and better at just verbalizing these questions. How did you experience the last 15 minutes? Because we can't assume that we know that through empathy. Um, our brains are actually helping us filter um, in our lives. So brain development is sequential. Our brains develop from the most primitive of our functions like heartbeat and temperature regulation and sleep, wake state, although if you have a brand new infant, you doubt me on that, because <laughs> you don't sleep very much, um, <laughs> etc. Um, all the way to um, the part of our brain that helps us do our most analytical thinking. And then beyond that, um, to the neural network, uh, the fine tuning of all of the connectedness um, in our brains. And in early um, childhood, from in, the in utero stage um, through the first few years of life, uh, the two regions in the limbic system that are very sensitive to experience, they're sensitive to all forms of maltreatment, we know, definitely. Um, and they're probably sensitive to all experiences that create high levels of cortisol and adrenaline in the bloodstream, because we know the mechanism now. Um, and that sensitivity affects the amygdala and the hippocampus. So these are sister, um, sister regions of the brain. The hippocampus is the part of the brain that helps us calm back down and registers all of that sensory information that was happening during danger as a memory. And it will encode that depending on how extreme our emotional response is. And then it's the hippocampus when we have that same sensory information come up again that says, hey, amygdala, this might be dangerous. It's a lot like what we had before. And the amygdala ramps up that stress response, orders the delivery of more cortisol, more adrenaline, our stress response, so that we can be faster, uh, stronger, right? We can deal with the danger. So they work together. Um, and that's uh, one of the reasons that we can find ourselves walking into an environment for no reason that we can figure out. All of a sudden our heart starts beating, we feel really stressed. It could be the smell in the room, the quality of the light. Our hippocampus may be sending a signal that there's something about that environment that reminds it about something, another time in life that felt like danger. So this stress activation can occur based on the memory system in the hippocampus, um, and that stress activation powerfully shapes the development of the brain. And so what can happen is even a small amount of stress for an adult who grew up with a lot of developmental stress, a small amount of stress can be perceived as a massive crisis because we're adapting in a way where we'll be more ready for danger in our lives. And the hippocampus also has delayed effects. We can have lots of um, uh, danger in our earliest years and not fully see all the symptoms from that for about seven to nine years later. And that's because we're born with baby or granule cells in the hippocampus that fail to blossom later on um, if they have been damaged by cortisol. So in early and middle childhood, the part of the brain that we talk about that's very sensitive to um, maltreatment, especially neglect and sexual abuse is the superhighway that connects the right left side of the brain and the front back of the brain. That's the corpus callosum. And that's the part of the brain that helps us do like story math problems, integrate math and language. It's what helps us integrate emotional and rational. It's what helps us integrate um, our creative and our analytical selves. Um, it's, it's really important for all um, of our most complex thinking. Um, and it's, it's highly sensitive um, to abuse, in the, to neglect in the early years, and then to sexual abuse on through about age 10. Dr. Vanner Kolk, um, yes? Do you have data on sexual abuse after the age of 10? Yes, different parts of the brain are more affected <coughs> by sexual abuse after the age of 10. Okay. But sexual abuse has an effect in several developmental periods. So Dr. Bessel Manifold, one of the leaders in the world on trauma-informed care, he's a neuroscientist and develops um, strategies for working with people 
that have had a lot of stress. He says that self-regulation depends on having a friendly relationship with your body. And if you don't have that, then you're going to rely on external means to help you regulate because you want to be regulated. And so you might do medication, drugs, constant reassurance, compulsive compliance with others. These things that we see in the population that can be very frustrating may in fact be people's attempt to find external ways to regulate when they feel constantly dysregulated in their lives. And he also says that we really just need to think of two main things when we're helping people be regulated. We want to think about activating their social engagement at the same time that we're calming the physical tensions in the body. And for people who grew up with a lot of danger, relationship may equal danger. And so we want many, many thousands of repetitions of I'm in relationship and I'm calm and safe. Those many thousands of repetitions is what helps people be on that flourishing path. And we can do that in many ways. These are just some examples. There's another region of the brain uh, that's extremely sensitive uh, during uh, middle childhood. And interestingly, it's sensitive to verbal abuse, emotional abuse, and bullying. Uh, this is a region of the brain, the right temporal gyrus, um, that uh, is usually would help us with social cognition, picking up social cues, and developing language and the communication among people around language development. And what Dr. Teicher has found is that it's extremely sensitive to threats, intimidation, humiliation, being sworn at, those kinds of things that can happen um, when uh, adults in the home don't know how to manage uh, the children in the home. They may resort to some of that kind of verbal abuse in order to manipulate children. And we used to think that only sticks and stones were going to hurt and ver words don't hurt you. But actually, the science is clear now that words do hurt you and they develop um, impacts on the brain much the same and some scientists would argue even stronger impacts than physical abuse, for example. And what we know from Dr. Teicher is that emotional abuse during this middle childhood and bullying during that same period can set up a risk for profound depression and suicide attempts throughout the rest of a person's life. And so we should be responding to bullying, especially in these years, as if it were a life-threatening act, um, and not just think, oh, children have done that forever, and so we'll just let it go. Um, we maybe didn't know then, but we do know now <laughs> that um, emotional abuse and bullying has a powerful effect, especially in middle childhood. So one of the things that we're building in the communities that are becoming more informed by this science is something I think of as just unconditional positive regard. That um, we can appreciate the awesome sacred self that each one of us is becoming <laughs> um, without necessarily loving every single behavior or every single outburst, but still that genuine heartfelt appreciation for other human beings goes a long ways to helping people be on that flourishing path. So here are some of the things that we like to talk about people doing. They're simple things. Just noticing what you like about other people and saying it out loud. Amazing how many people tell me that nobody's ever said anything positive about them to them. We maybe just don't say it. We're probably thinking it. Um, asking people, tell me something that you enjoy about yourself or tell me something that your child is good at. Um, since I saw you last time, tell me something you've done that's fun. Just to engage in those conversations that draw out something that we can admire about one another. So I wanted to also mention the cerebellar vermis. This um, is the part of the brain that's thought of as a seat of mental health. It's extremely sensitive to sexual abuse right around puberty. Um, and uh, this is another part of the brain where we're born with the granule cells, those baby cells that are pre-programmed to blossom after, uh, in early adulthood. And uh, cortisol can damage those cells, it can also kill those cells. And so it's one of the reasons that we may have uh, extreme stressors in the pre-puberty, just before puberty, and not see the symptoms of mental health challenges until early adulthood. But uh, impacts to the cerebellar vermis are um, associated with all of the diagnosable mental health conditions from hallucinations to depression, anxiety disorders, and on and on and on. 
Um, and so we know now that we don't just need to protect and nurture children in the first three years. That middle childhood, that pre-puberty, and on into adolescence, we continue to have these vulnerable times when our relationships with other people and our sense of safety really matters. So I wanted to talk specifically about um, three strategies that we can use. Um, they're simple, safety, curiosity, and play. And uh, now brain scientists are telling us how they release um, the kinds of chemicals in our brains that allow us to feel calm and feel happy and fulfilled, that reward reinforcement system in our brain. When we set up environments that don't have any threats, we're increasing serotonin, um, adrenaline um, is reduced, um, and we end up with a happy and relaxed state. And so we need to be asking people how they experience the environments they're in because um, if they experience that as danger, then they're going to have increased cortisol levels. If they experience it as safe, they're going to have reduced. And we may not be able to guess which one they experience. Um, when we arouse curiosity um, and interest, we're going to reduce that reactivity, that emotional reactivity. And we can increase dopamine, which allows us to have that sense of awe and joy um, and grasping our own sense of efficacy. And when we have this bilateral um, movement, and you know, a simple way is just you touch your right hand to your left knee and vice versa, right? It's just crossing your body. Dr. Bruce Perry, who's an amazing um, trauma-informed care development specialist and neurobiologist, he has uh, little children, he puts giant flip chart paper on the wall and he puts a crayon or marker in each hand and he plays music and they dance across the body making, making art. Um, really healing for children that have experienced a lot of trauma. So as we go into adulthood, our cortex, the frontal part of our brain and uh, the outer layer of the brain continues to be sensitive all the way into our, um, our middle um, 20s, some people say our early 30s. Um, and um, that part of the brain helps us with long-term memory and executive function, that set of skills that helps us set a goal and take action toward it. So I already made this point that stress um, thresholds are set largely by adulthood. The amount of stress that it takes for someone to experience crisis is largely set by adulthood. Uh, and so we have a lot of negative things we say about people that have crisis after crisis in their lives. But actually, they're not, fat, they're not making up crisis. They're actually experiencing crisis. Uh, and so we maybe could have more compassion for what that might feel like. So I'm going to breeze through these. You know what these uh, mean, because we just walked through a lot of them. So I want to get to another section here. Um, Self-care is critical. And um, let me just say a few things. That sense of being mindful, being aware of how you are in the present moment your body, your breathing, um, very important uh, for helping with stress reduction. Uh, deep belly breaths make a big difference for helping people re-regulate. And just having the habit of when you're noticing people around you that are escalating in their stress, you can say, oh, I just want to take a minute now because I'm feeling a little stressed. Let's take three deep breaths. Just go ahead and take them with them. And let your whole diagram expand and then contract. Three breaths and you'll feel the whole room pull back down. Um, movement, music, dance, exercise, sleep. Lots of us don't get enough sleep. <laughs> and laughter. And I want to emphasize that a lot of times we think we have to have something to laugh about, but actually if you just start laughing, <laughs> it actually has the same chemical response in your body. And uh, I found when my mom was dying of dementia, my daughter figured out that we could just show up and laugh and she would laugh. We had no idea why, she had no idea why, but everybody would feel better as we laughed. Uh, so I just want to walk through the pattern we can see in the Washington data. There's a progression of adversity that um, we can now recognize, uh, that early trauma and stress create these predictable patterns, that those predictable patterns uh, lead to cognitive challenges, which are in that top box, attentional challenges, and also behavior and relationship challenges. And that constellation leads to a real risk for early use of drugs and alcohol 
And when people are using drugs and alcohol as an external regulator, it often feels right, as opposed to those of us who maybe tried something young and went, ew, I wouldn't even do that, right? Um, for some people, they try and it's like, oh, well, this is what life is supposed to feel like. And so there's a tendency for that to continue. Um, that pattern is linked to uh, higher referrals to special ed, um, more school failure, more dropping out of school, more uh, social and relational <coughs> problems, suspension, expulsion, delinquency, and incarceration. We can see these patterns clearly in the population data now in Washington. And those are the fast track to being more low income as an adult, um, having more challenges as an adult, um, having, um, and having risk to transmit um, challenges to the next generation. So we're closing at 1? One? 1.30. OK. Um, so I want to show you uh, what happens when we pile on on top of adverse childhood experiences, we often have adverse adult experiences because of that progression I just showed you. And so in Washington, we started looking at the data that we had and said, well, what happens with people's daily functioning when they have adverse childhood experiences plus a bunch of adverse adult experiences? Because in the end, we want people functioning well enough to contribute to a healthier community, right? Mm -hmm. So functioning really matters. Even if I don't feel very good, if I can get up and go about my day and participate, that matters. And so we looked inside of this, uh, the telephone survey that we use with adults, and we looked at this, the answers to this question. During the last 30 days, about how many days did poor physical or mental health keep you from doing usual activities? So it's, um, it's on a scale that's that person's usual activities. Um, and uh, I'll be walking through this. Um, on the left, you see uh, major adult stressors, major adult adversity, homelessness, incarceration, chronic illness, separation, divorce, depression, and worker injury or illness. And all of the people that are represented in these bars have an ACE score of three or more. So these bars, the height of the bars is three ACEs plus how many of those adult major stressors on the left. And the height of the bars represents the percentage of people who said for half to all of the month, I couldn't do my usual activities. So I don't know about you, that would be maybe never in my life have I had months where half to all of my um, month, I couldn't do my own usual activities. Um, and so it's remarkable how many people said that that was true in their lives. And you can see that people with three or more ACEs plus zero or one, a pretty small percentage said I can't do usual activities half or all the month. But as we allow this pylon of major adult adversity, we see that number jump. So three aces plus two adult adversities on the left, we see it jump to 17%. And three aces plus three of the adversities on the left, we see this jump to 57%. When you have 57% of a population group that can't do usual activities half to all of the month, what concerns me about that is, is partly that I care about them, but it's also that I'm all about building healthy communities. We can't access their gifts. They don't have a way to give their gifts. We can't, right? Because they're not able to participate because of the way we structure opportunities in the majority culture. So like we have one public health department in Washington that looked at this data and said, you know, we're making, our programs are all appointment based. And if you're one of these people with three plus threes, maybe you're going to have a hard time showing up at an appointment. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so they changed one. One of the programs they changed was the WIC program, the nutrition for um, pregnant and nursing moms and, and their infants. And they said, well, let's try drop-in. And uh, so they created a drop-in WIC one day a week um, because they couldn't afford to do it more than one day. And WIC enrollment tripled. And not only did WIC enrollment triple, but because WIC's paid for with enrollment dollars, revenue tripled. Uh, and so they could afford to staff that WIC drop-in room with a RN who was a nurse home visitor, and they were able to staff an infant care room with licensed child care professionals. And moms started showing up and staying all day. And they started building a social network to help each other on the days where they couldn't really figure out how to navigate their day and started trading childcare and building help for each other in their lives. And 
A decade later, those nurses were asking the parents, have those relationships been? Those are my closest friends throughout my parenting years. But those were parents who weren't able to show up. Two thirds of them were parents who weren't able to show up in an appointment-based system. So simple changes can make a really big difference. So parenting adults really have the most power for preventing high A scores in the next generation. But parenting can feel a lot harder um, for people with multiple ACE uh, attributable problems because it is really hard. And let me show you about Mason County, um, the other very difficult data to swallow. In fact, when I first saw this, I just cried because Mason County, the, the blue bars on the left are the youngest. This is the younger parenting age, 18 to 34 population. And the brown bars on the right are the people 35 to 54. And you can see that we have the highest percentage in the state of parents with three or more ACEs in that youngest group. And we see this huge jump for the, the parenting age 35 to 54. 35% of them had an ACE score of three or more. That jumps clear to 63% uh, for the youngest parent. So those of us that are not in that 18 to 34, I'm 61 now. Um, I can't assume I understand through empathy what it's like to parent uh, in Mason County right now because the social network around those people is filled with other people who also had a lot of adversity while they were children. And that means we need to engage that younger generation to help us understand and to um, help, us, help us help them um, lead a different trend for that next set of children. Because without intentionally working to prevent ACEs in the next generation, the natural tendency will be to increase the ACE scores even more. So I, I have my own theories as to why we might have such high ACE prevalence in Mason County, um, but probably a lot of us could um, think that through and have different explanations. But the numbers don't lie. Uh, this is a random sample, telephone sample. It's weighted by the CDC. Um, we've got some real challenge in this next generation of parents. And they're probably really struggling uh, with their functioning in daily life and with trying to figure out, why is it hard for me? My mom didn't have this much trouble not knowing, well, your mom was surrounded by a group of people that wasn't as deeply affected by adversity. So your mom had a different support system around her, and that story needs to be told so that young people don't think it's their fault. <laughs> yeah? Wouldn't that number possibly be too low if you were only calling call people who had phones? Yes, I think it's a low estimate. Because there's a huge amount of people who do not have landlines. I agree with you, I think it's a low estimate. And some people have said, well, we have two tribes in Washington, and historical trauma leads to higher risk for ACE. And that's true. But the tribal numbers are not big enough to be driving this number. The, the number of people um, in the sample size wasn't large enough. We're growing our own adverse childhood experiences here. Um, and uh, I will also say that I've had audiences in Mason County say, um, well, it's probably the recent immigrants. And actually, when we look across the state, we don't have a large enough sample size to answer that question for Mason County. But when we look across the state, the Spanish-speaking recent immigrants have lower ACE prevalence. So we have to catch ourselves with our assumptions about um, where we're holding the adversity in Mason County. It's likely we're holding it among people who look a lot like us in this room. <laughs> and um, for whatever social reasons, um, that prevalence has escalated over this last period of time. So I, I really think our highest strategy, um, and I, this is what I teach nationwide, I work in about half the states in any given year, um, so you're not unique, I say this every place, is that we need to work with the people with the highest A scores, the parenting adults, and help them function better and give them better supports because those parents are the, have the most power for preventing ACEs in their children. Um, so there's a tendency to hear adverse childhood experience, that word childhood, and think all of our time, effort, money should go into the children, but it's the parents who have the most power for preventing ACEs, and we have to find better ways for engaging those parents and supporting them. But ACEs aren't destiny. 
Um, lot, in lots and lots of places, we're seeing parents very affected by ACEs stepping up and leading really a revolution um, that's very focused and they're excited about preventing ACEs in the next generation. And this is an image that Rob Anda created just to encourage people to understand that the people with the most power for changing that whole system um, in the community are going to be the people most affected by ACEs. And the rest of the service systems should be in service to those individuals. That's a really different way of thinking about the role of a service system, but especially when we're in a community with such high ACE prevalence, we simply can't use a 50-minute therapy session to get out of this. There, we don't have enough 50 minutes. We don't have enough professional. We have to develop a healthier culture, a healthier way of living with one another and supporting with one another in a day-by-day -day way. So I wanted to just walk you through um, what, what I think is the change that we should be trying to aim for, and that's a change from the loop that's on the left to the loop that's on the right. So the left loop is considered a vicious reinforcing cycle, I meaning it, it will take us on that downward spiral. This is probably the loop we've been on. Um, it's my best guess. That ACEs lead to adaptation. Um, that has led in the past to this policy, so to speak, of reject, eject. Um, and that increases, it escalates the level of adult adversity. When there's more adversity high up on top of childhood adversity, then we get more ACE attributable problems and less functionality, which leads to the transmission of ACEs in the next generation. I would suspect that's probably the pattern we have when you think, look at it at a big picture level. And I think a pretty simple change will make a difference. So ACEs are still going to lead to adaptation here in the green cycle. But instead of reject and eject, um, we're going to build the capabilities in the community to find those right fit engagements, those ways of inviting people to participate in community life, even if it's in a small way, it's a good fit for the gifts that they bring into this world. And that leads to adults being more on that steady, continuous growing into well-being because they are able to contribute and get that positive feedback in their lives and build efficacy, that leads to less ACE and trivial problems and lower ACE transmission. So that's why I do this work, because I think the most powerful place to intervene is in community. It's in the risk community response to the individuals who've had the most adversity. That's where we're going to see the big shifts, and that's where we are seeing the big shifts in the so when you look across the resilience literature, they say, here's what we need to focus on. Um, there's three protective systems that human beings rely on to do well in their lives. Our capabilities, um, our sense of belonging with others, and that sphere that's larger than our immediate circle, that sphere of community, culture, and spirituality. Ann Masson, who's one of the leading um, researchers in resilience in the world, says that um, when we do damage to those three spheres, um, we have a lot of problems, and when we intentionally build those and strengthen those, that's how we get healing and resilience in the population. And I think there's wide agreement in the literature, not just from Anne, but from many um, researchers about that. And I would submit to you, I think in the majority culture in the United States, we've done a lot of damage to all three of these spheres. Uh, we've, we've invested a lot in capabilities. That most of the capabilities we've invested a lot in are capabilities that have to do with working. Um, and so we're just now saying, oh, we need relational capabilities in order to work, right? But that's fairly recent. I mean, for a long time, it was like, we just need these technical abilities, right? And then we started going, oh, my goodness, people have to work on teams, right? So we're, we're building all of that um, now, but we haven't invested as much in belonging or community culture and spirituality. So these issues I'm talking about, they're really complex. Um, the resources are finite, especially in a community where we have such high ACE prevalence. Um, I don't remember where I was, uh, but I think it was a league member who said to me, uh, why are we spending so much money on criminal justice in Mason County? And do you understand now why we would be? Because, because people, it people have there. deeper problems, That's right? right. <laughs> We're waiting until the behaviors have gotten to that level and people are that struggling at that level, and then we're using the criminal justice system as our primary mental health system, as our primary community response system. Yeah. And I hate to say it, but there's more money in not really solving the problems yeah. and job security than there is in actually putting the correct resources in the community to solve the problems. Mm -hmm. 
comes down to, you know, if you create a system that's uh, ineffective and, and people don't get what they need, they're going to have to come back to your system. And, and now you've got, you're, twice you've made money off of them, or three times. Um, I know one thing I've been trying to work on um, in our community is getting medication-assisted treatment into our community. And that's something that is federally recognized as a, a healthy, um, safe way of dealing with the heroin epidemic. And unfortunately, what I'm up against in the community is the old school of thought that it's sobriety or nothing. And unfortunately, what they're doing by, by saying you have to be completely sober or, um, or you're an addict, they're setting people up for all of these overdoses that we're seeing because they don't have proper drug education for these individuals. And so when they do relapse, which is an inevitable part of addiction, when they do relapse, they don't have the education to understand how they could relapse. It's harm reduction in a safe way. I, <laughs> it, you know, that's what I focus on with the population that I work with is harm reduction because working with populations that have high ACE scores, they're not, it's not always possible to bring them to what society would, the box that society would want them in. But how can we take them from what they're doing that's really, really bad, and how can we make it safer for them, safer for the children? How, um, so that's a really good example of where a mental model, a belief about what causes opioid addiction, right? Can get in the way of using these newer discoveries to actually solve the problem. Because we get stuck in the belief, and then we keep on answering in the same way, <laughs> um, even if that way doesn't work very well. So that's a good example. And many treatment groups are now um, educating uh, each other about ACEs and talking about, well, if a small amount of stress can feel like a, a crisis to us, then we're more likely to relapse with a small amount of stress. And so what does that mean about our peer support system that we need to put in place? And coming up themselves, just basically by understanding these dynamics, they come up themselves with a different kind of peer support that's more able to respond even in small amounts of stress to one another and provide adequate help. There, there are some good things going on with linking um, mothers that are in recovery with uh, mothers that may be pregnant using drugs yeah. and, and that's actually taking people in our community that believed they were no good they believed they had nothing to offer and I look at them and I go but you're a really great mom and you pulled yourself out of your situation and, and you could pull someone else out of it and and it's finding each individual person's strengths and, and building on those and um, now more than ever I understand that it takes a community and I think that a big part of changing the ACEs is that we have to change our fundamental thinking as society um, around certain issues. Um, I, for instance, work with pregnant women that use drugs while they're pregnant. That is a very tough group to advocate for. I just went to a conference down in Loma Linda and I was there to try to get the care providers at the hospital to be compassionate to this group of women. And I had to joke with my colleagues after I got there because I found out that I was on a campus that was Seventh-day Adventist. So they didn't even have caffeine, sugar, meat. And I said, you know, guys, it's hard enough for me to get a normal person to come around and be compassionate. I said, the joke was on Megan because you didn't tell me my work was going to be cut out. I'm asking them to take a really big leap. But but community education is so important because this problem's not going to go away. And um, I, I, I appreciate it. Huh? Yeah. Nobody's immune, not even Lola Linda. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. No um, I was, could you go back to the past slide, please? Um, OK, maybe the one the next one. OK, core protective, and you're talking about uh, community and culture and spirituality and, and how people are right now realizing we have to have teamwork and stuff like that. I would suggest that 
um, maybe 70 years ago, horse and buggy age. Yeah. There was a lot more teamwork. There was a lot of community. People sat point. on their porches. They walked. There was a community. Yeah. And I think we've walled ourselves off. And so perhaps what we need to do is think about what worked back then. Uh -huh. It wasn't perfect. There were poor houses. There were all kinds of uglinesses. People were killed all the time. But uh, for many reasons. Um, but possibly, you know, we haven't lost it totally. You know, maybe we don't have to way reinvent things, yeah. but we have to rebuild, yeah. perhaps. Yeah, I think um, I think I should just leave this up and we should continue to talk because I think the point you're making is well taken. And in other parts of the world, um, community is very strong, right? It's not that it's not that we're unable to shift cultural norms and have strength in all three. We can. But the cultural norms tend to be, what, on autopilot. We, we're not talking about them. We're not talking about how are we doing with this isolation thing? <laughs> um, and really intentionally trying to build a different way of interacting with one another. And that's what it's going to take. It's, and I agree that the ways communities were laid out, I mean, the great halls in this community are amazing. And they're evidence of strong community here. Um, <laughs> And they're still there as an asset and as a possible well, way of... We have to kill John Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the myth of the yeah. rugged individualist yeah. who's capable to do everything on their own. I think it, it's strong in communities that have physical labor kinds of roots, yeah. like our loggers and... and uh, uh, the, the people who had to face really hard physical yep. uh, adversities to to live out here, and and I I don't know how many generations it might have taken for that to fail for for us to have it filtered down to us that yep. Dad died because a tree fell on him or uh, whatever the number and breadth of adverse experiences that could happen, but I think that that's part. And then you add to it the fact that the jobs have gone away, and now we've got the homelessness and the, the you know, poverty to, to add to those, those situations. And in Mason County, it wasn't just jobs that went away. It was the way of life. The way of life. Yeah. That is a pretty significant impact on any human being. When human beings, no matter where you are in the world, have an assault on their cultural way of life, you see these kinds of problems increase. Unless there's intentional transition support from someplace, that's what happens. Uh, that's my question. Has, the, has your, have your scientists studied what happens to children and people who live in Syria or other countries that are um, suffering as they are? And I mean, that must be some horrendous statistical the World Health Organization, um, both Rob and Vince consulted with them to develop a World Health uh, Adverse Childhood Experience uh, study uh, that includes additional factors like witnessing uh, violence in a war zone, uh, forced soldiering, those kinds of things. Um, and uh, we're seeing um, the data just now coming in, um, being analyzed from those studies. Um, I think the jury's still out about the power of chronic adversity over many um, developmental stages is, is very powerful um, versus acute danger in one stage. It's also powerful, but maybe only powerful with one main region of the brain that's sensitive at that time. And so a lot of what we believe to be the most powerful um, was about um, the severity of the violence when the chronicity of adversity also is very, very powerful. And in the United States, we're seeing more chronicity. Um, and so it's stretching across many developmental stages, and it's shaping a wider array of function. Yeah. Go ahead, Tom. I just wanted to know, um, in the study, does it sit, does, is this like people who have grown up and lived in this area or are people coming um, are people attracted to an area that has this because i just want to say for myself really quick i'm really i just think your presentation is awesome and 
it really got me thinking because I have a high number of these ACEs, mm -hmm. but at 64 in the lifetime of therapy and all that, I think I've done pretty good. I think you can sure. come out, you know, but, but what really strikes me is when you think about our parents, you know, like, I don't know, my parents, I mean, my dad came from a mining family, my mom, dirt farmers, dirt poor, mm -hmm. tons of dysfunction. And so hearing this generational transfer that can come, I, I think that that is like an incredible piece of knowledge that can actually, I mean, to me, it seems like it's almost changing some of my core in a way just to know that just that really know. is true. Yeah. That, and, and the things that I think we could have gotten passed down onto us from our own parents, they had it rough, man. I mean, the depression. Right. The way women were treated. I mean, we're kind of in trauma right now with the person running the country. Not to get political, but I think he's a bully. And I think it can bring our aces back up even. So this is such yeah, great information is power, right? I mean, this is really And your point that, you know, it's a huge you. gift for a generation even to bring the ACE scores a tiny bit. We don't have to get to zero. To make a huge difference in health and well-being, I think the story of our time is is the story of a parenting generation handing to their children a little bit less adversity than they had. And for many of us, that's our story. My A score is five. My parents' A scores were higher than mine. Thank you. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's you amazing. It's, it's an incredible gift. Yeah. Okay, so it's really quick. It's 25 after so about five more minutes. Um, I, want to to I want to suggest that if we want to stay here and talk, we don't have to end as long as Laura Some will people, stay here. I'm happy to stay. To Some people that. may have to end. So while you're asking, I'm just going to pull up this slide that says what this group maybe could do. Because that might be okay. Well, so go ahead. You hit, you hit on one of your slides. You mentioned that ADHD was a possible symptom of a lot of this. There's been a huge increase in autism spectrum disorders yes. over the last 10 or 20 right. years. Do we think that this could possibly also be affecting that? If it's, it's an actual chemical neurological thing, but that might also be responsible. I haven't for found a neuroscience that, that says that yet, a neuroscientist yet, so I don't know what that research. I think we're at the beginning of understanding. For example, the symptoms of ADD and ADHD um, uh, Many, many children who are diagnosed with those actually have a child version of PTSD. It's not the same origin. And so now they're realizing they need two separate ways of treating um, and, uh, and that the limbic irritability that um, children have that can mimic a seizure disorder um, can also be limbic irritability that has its origins in adversity. So the science is so new. I think we don't know yet a lot of what's shaping but if we approached autism with the compassion and understanding that it could well have some of the similar seeds and starts as what we're talking about with childhood adversity, I think that can't be a bad thing. Oh, no, not at all. Right. No, right. Yeah. I just like to make a quick comment. Thank you so much for coming today. This has been just a great presentation. Yeah. And the other thing that I want to thank you for, I thought when I came in and I saw, as I was watching this, that you were going to tell us that the schools need to do more. Oh. And I'm so thankful that you did not <laughs> say that. Because I think there's such, um, we put such a huge mission on the schools and to add this. Not to say that they can't, that there right. aren't ways that can be helped, but we can't put this additional burden. It's a, it's a community response. The challenge in the school is a reflection of the challenge in the community. So we have to own it as a community. And if schools need to change, we need to help make that right. It's it's ours collectively to hold. And so I you know, I do work with schools that are changing, but they're changing in the context of the community also changing. Um, I won't work with a school that isn't embedded in a community that's committed to change. Um, that's I just won't take the contract. <laughs> right, you're wasting time. It's not fair to change the, it's good to change the environment in school so children feel safe and they're better to able to learn, but if you send them home to danger every night, um, is that really true compassion, right? Yeah. We've got to hold this together. Yeah. Just to follow on to that, 
the schools are dealing with all of these issues with the kids who go there every day anyway and um, probably don't have many tools to deal with it. So that's part of the environment that the kids have to grow up in. Right. Uh, you know, so it's not putting the burden of blame on the schools, but what are we offering schools as part of the community to deal with these issues? Mm -hmm. well, I just like to say as a teacher, um, I would uh, see a kid on Monday and they'd be a basket case. They would be acting out. It would just be ugly. It was sad. And then by Friday, because they'd been in school, you know, we were relaxed, things were okay, we forward, and they'd go home for the weekend for 48 hours of chaos or whatever was happening. Well, I'm a member of the truancy board, and I see the ones who think school is the worst cauldron that they can find <laughs> themselves in and do everything to avoid it. So. Yeah, there's every different response, um, but I think the bigger picture is the important one to keep in touch with, and that is that it feels hard in Mason County because it is. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I just I just want a moment to right. to walk through some things we might do here next. Yeah. So this talks about what we can do, but it would be helpful to know what are some of the things that are that we have done that are being done in Mason County that work. So that we get a feel for the positive steps to be taken, the type of programs that work. Um, I think the challenge with that question is that we could probably list um, treatment programs and that sort of thing that are effective, that are evidence-based practice, that are delivered well, but um, they won't have enough effect size to meet the needs of such a huge percentage of young parents with such high ACE prep. We're going to have to be able to invest in the community's culture change, which would be a whole other talk I'd be happy to come and give about how you uh, foster culture change in a community. Um, and uh, what we found in the 17 years that I was working with communities across the state on that, and we had a lot of success, um, was that you have to engage in uh, a four-phased uh, rhythm of engagement and Mason County has struggled with that. And I think that Mason County struggled because we've, our systems are flooded, they feel overwhelmed. To think about um, moving from the customers or clients I work with every day to culture, it feels overwhelming. And so who's the group that can hold that larger vision of we're actually going to support a whole generation differently? Um, and, but it is possible. I, I could, if people want to stay, I have um, a subject in here on what changed in Cowlitz County, very similar community, also tremendously and deeply affected by the timber industry change and the fishing industry and mining industry change. Um, and they've done very intentional community building work in addition to improving their direct services. Um, but, and they have um, big, very positive outcomes at the population level, reductions in substance use, reductions in infant mortality, reductions in hospitalizations, and on and on. But I think that's the issue of can we, can, we, um, can we attract and retain a group that is interested in uh, talking about and facilitating change at the community level. And that's been difficult in Mason County. Well, Laura, for those of us who have to go at 1.30, can you just summarize very quickly that you guys can stay after and then talk as long as you like to summarize this, this actually? So the, the summary is, I think, the, the one of the very first steps is to raise the overall knowledge about how experience shapes development. Because what happens in the population is if people don't understand that, then they have shame and blame around it. must be my fault. Why am I not having an easy right? So I think general education is important. <coughs> easy steps would be um, hosting film showings. There are a couple really great films that were made by uh, Jamie Redford, promoting you know, education, that sort of thing. Um, the second is, I think from a policy standpoint, Amy, um, I feel strongly, and if I were still an elected official here in Mason County, which by the way I will not be, <laughs> um, um, I would be, I probably would be filing lawsuits about um, resource distribution. Because uh, resources are distributed based on population, but we, our population has a lot deeper need. 
And this science can reliably predict that need and can also reliably predict the cause. And so these formulas need to change, um, and we know plenty in order to advocate for Mason County having a different kind of formula distribution. How would you change the formula? How would you change the distribution from the way it is now? I would embed ACE prevalence into the formulas so that um, it was one of the drivers of the distribution formulas. What effect is the fact that all of our disability and mental health money goes to Thurston County to spit back out to us when they feel like it? Yeah. Can't even tell us how much they spend in Mason County or on what? So those are, those are the kind of system problems that if we had a group that was really holding the system as a whole, those things would pop up. But they tend, and they have, since, since 1990, we were debating that same thing. And they pop up as there must be someone to blame, as opposed to we've got systemic problems that are driving us deeper and deeper. Um, and it's not that there's someone to blame. It's that our cultural base doesn't hold on to the kind of mental health professionals that would be awesome in that system, et cetera. There's a lot of systemic issues. So the second, um, so also there is an emerging national um, policy group, um, uh, the Campaign for Trauma-Informed Policy and Practice, um, that has a new grassroots um, arm to it. So staying up to date, there is federal legislation passing through now looking at um, the opioid crisis and making sure that as we're using that money, we're using it in a trauma-informed way. Um, we can support innovation, um, and we can, one, I know the League is very famous for doing um, reports and research and helping other people understand a bigger picture. And I think in Mason County mapping the system of care, um, as you were suggesting, and the support that currently exists for young parents so that we can put side by side Here's the level of challenge. Here are the strategies we're using. Then we could actually have a more intelligent conversation about, is this a robust enough system, or are we going to need to really work differently in the future? And I think if we saw that picture, we would see that it's, it's not a robust enough system. But that's not because we, we've stopped working hard. We're working, uh, we're working ourselves to death. Um, and the resource distribution doesn't support um, what we need. So I think from an uh, advocacy point of view, I think coming together with the other timber distressed communities with high ACE prevalence and beginning to build a lobbying force around um, changing the way um, that we're operating with one another and having a stronger voice with one another could make a really big difference. Yes, Across the country, there's increased knowledge um, of this science. It's, we're only two decades in, so it's the beginning, um, but there's increased knowledge and increased opportunity because of that knowledge. So those are my suggestions today um, for what we might do. And I'll stay, but I know some of you need to leave. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Thank you. Some of us do need to leave at 1.30. Um,